So we're going to start Christianity, and we're going to begin tonight by talking about the New Testament, that is to say the Christian scriptures, and then uh, next week, next Tuesday, inshallah, uh, we're going to look at the Nicene Creed, <clears throat> Orthodox Christian Creed, Trinitarian Creed, uh, as well uh, as the Trinity. Um, so that's the plan for Christianity. And again, we are live. Um, I'm looking at the chat box here. So if there are any questions, I, I forgot to mention this in weeks past, unfortunately. Uh, but if there are people that want to ask questions, you can go ahead and type them into the chat box. Um, and uh, I'll answer them. If they're appropriate, um, I'll answer them on the, uh, on the air, inshallah. OK, so last week we said that the primary text of Judaism uh, is the Old Testament. Of course, again, Old Testament is Christian terminology. Uh, it's called the Tanakh in Hebrew which of course again stands for Torah, Nebim, Ketobim. The, the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books, the prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the writings like Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, First and Second Kings, so on and so forth. Okay, uh, with the New Testament, um, we have uh, something interesting. So, so the Christians now, they believe in the Old Testament, right? Um, they believe it to be the Word of God. However, they have their own set of primary scriptures. And these scriptures are not affirmed by uh, the Jews. Um, uh, so it doesn't look like the uh, video is working here. Uh, inshallah, it'll come back. <clears throat> so I can, uh, if people have questions, we can deal with that, inshallah ta'ala. So New Testament, right? It's called the He Kenai Diatheke, literally the New Testament. Now, the phrase New Testament is actually in the Old Testament. It's in Jeremiah 31 31, where there's this promise of God that I'm going to establish what's called a Birit Chadasha in Hebrew, which literally means New Testament. Of course, the Jews take that to mean something completely different than the Christians uh, <clears throat> in Jewish circles. Uh, Jeremiah is prophesizing that towards the end of time, during the reign of the Messiah, the Messiah will implement the Jewish law, and that's going to be new for most people because most people are not Jews. And it's going to also be sort of a renewal for Jews that weren't practicing uh, the law. But nonetheless, <clears throat> this is the name of the Christian scriptures, the New Testament. So what is the essence of the Old Testament? <clears throat> the Old Birit, the word Birit means testament. Uh, it basically is the following. It is if you adhere to the law of Moses, if you follow the law of Moses, then you will gain salvation. Right? That's, that's basically the, the essence of the law. Um, uh, the, the essence of the law in a nutshell. Let me just quickly try something here uh, so I can uh, try this again. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Okay, I think we're okay now. Yes, so let me just reiterate. Um, uh, it's Tuesday, uh, August 18th, Tuesday evening. We are live. Um, for people out there that want to ask me a question, feel free to type that into the chat box, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, so. The, the essence of the Old Testament is, uh, or the Mosaic Covenant, which is preferred language according to Jews, is that if you follow the law of God, you follow the mitzvot, right, and you will be saved, you will gain salvation. And this is interesting because this is the answer of Jesus, peace be upon him, at least according to the New Testament Gospels. And we'll talk more about these, you know, what are these Gospels. There are four Gospels in the Christian New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You have this... Uh, pericope or this, um, this story in three Gospels where a, a Jewish scribe comes to Jesus and he says to him, good master, what must I do to gain eternal life? And then Jesus says to him, why are you calling me good? There's no one good but one and that is God. And then he continues, follow the commandments and you shall enter the life. 
right? And there are variations. I mean, that's the, the reading in Mark. That's how Mark has it. There's slight variations in Matthew and Luke. That's Mark 10, 18. And you have it in Luke 18, 18 and Mark, uh, Matthew 19, 17. So here, Jesus, peace be upon him, according to this Christian text, these Christian texts, is affirming the old Berit, the Mosaic Covenant. But then by Gospel's end, right, later on in the Gospel, Mark 14, Matthew 26, and Luke 22, uh, we are told that Jesus celebrates the uh, Passover, the Last Supper with his disciples, and he takes the bread and he gives it to them and says, uh, this is my, uh, the bread and the wine. He says, this is my body, this is my blood of the new covenant, right, of the new testament. So now he's establishing a new covenant, right? a new agreement. So what that means is now is that the old covenant that God made with the Israelites at Sinai, this uh, covenant has been revoked, it is abrogated, right? Uh, and now um, one has to simply believe uh, in uh, Jesus as Lord, as Paul says, and that God raised him from the dead, and you shall be saved. Right? So that's the essence. Um, uh, Paul states this, I believe, in 1 Corinthians. That's the essence of this new covenant then. Okay, so let's take a closer look then at the, the New Testament. So there are 39 books in the Old Testament. There are 27 books in the New Testament. <clears throat> called a canon of 27 books. Um, there are four, four major types of books in the New Testament. The first major type of book is called a gospel. So a gospel is basically a narrative about Jesus that really focuses on the passion, right? Uh, the last week of Jesus' life, according to these texts. So they're basically four extended passion narratives. The real focus is on the suffering and death, resurrection uh, of Jesus. Um, that's really where the focus is. So you have, you have uh, gospel, one of the types of books of the New Testament. There are four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We'll talk more about them, inshallah. Then you have a book of history, one book of history in the New Testament. It's the fifth book of the New Testament. It's called the book of Acts, A-C-T-S, also called Acts of the Apostles in, in, the Catholic, uh, in the Catholic version, English versions. So basically, this is early ecclesiastical history, early church history. Um, there are three main characters, really two main characters. There's Peter and there's Paul, but there's also James, right? Acts chapter 15, you have the famous Jerusalem Council. This is really this sort of seminal event. Um, in uh, the early Christian movement uh, and the sort of prototype of the later church councils, ecumenical church councils that are going to follow in the 4th century all the way into the um, 21st century uh, or 20th century. We haven't had one. There hasn't been an ecumenical church council in the 21st century. The last one was in the 1960s called Vatican II. So the sort of um, uh, prototype uh, of that, the archetype, was uh, the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. And the issue of that time was how much of the Mosaic law is required for these Gentile proselytes, for these Greeks, the Greeks are becoming Christian, how much of the law of Moses should we impose upon them? That's why they held the council, basically. So you have early church history, the book of Acts. And then you have something called uh, the epistles, which simply means letters. And there are 21 of them. So there are four gospels. There's one book of history called the book of Acts. Then you have 21 epistles or letters. And these are written by various apostles, right? various apostolic authorities, various uh, disciples of Jesus, at least according to Christian Christian tradition. So these epistles, they deal with doctrine, they deal with counsel, instructions, um, they deal with um, just different issues that arise in various congregations. According to uh, historians, um, 
seven of these 21 epistles were genuinely written by Paul, right? The Apostle Paul. We'll talk about him, inshallah. Um, so scholars agree almost by consensus that, that seven of them are written by Paul. Seven of them, another seven of them, are disputed uh, but claimed to have been written by Paul. Right? In other words, someone pretending to be Paul. Uh, so scholars have deemed these to be pseudo-Pauline, which is sort of a nice way of saying they're forgeries. Right? Someone is writing these letters pretending to be Paul, and they're not Paul. They're forging these letters uh, pretending to be Paul. And then you have seven what are known as Catholic epistles. Not Catholic with a capital C, not Roman Catholic, but Catholic with a lowercase c, which simply means universal epistles. And these are written by various uh, apostles as well, like James and Peter and John and Jude, although, again, the vast majority of historians do not believe that these men actually wrote these books uh, that bear their names. These are also forgeries. Uh, when it comes to the Gospels, they're called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but in reality, they are anonymous. Uh, none of the authors identify themselves. Church tradition um, assigns them or attributes these books to two disciples of Jesus, Matthew the tax collector, who's also called Levi, and John, Yohanan, the son of Zebedee, who's one of the disciples of Jesus, the beloved disciple, according to the Gospel of John, although it's disputed whether John, the son of Zebedee, is the beloved disciple. That's the dominant opinion. Uh, historians do not believe that these two men actually wrote these Gospels. And then you have the Gospel of Mark. Mark um, was, according to church tradition, he was a student of Peter. Um, so he's like a tabi'i. And then you have the Gospel of Luke, who is a, uh, a friend of Paul or Paul's traveling companion. So this is very interesting, we notice, that you have the Gospel of Mark, which is accepted by the church as totally canonical um, and written around, uh, according to the vast majority of historians, uh, probably around 70 of the common era or so. Most historians put the date, even many confessional uh, Christian scholars, they place the date of Mark's Gospel around 70, around the time of the destruction of the temple. Um, but there's also something called the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Peter is not accepted as canon. And the reason is, well, it's just too late. Uh, that's one sort of way of looking at it. Uh, another way of looking at it is that it uh, contains material that is, that is offensive uh, to the early Christian movement. So in the Gospel of Peter, um, it states that uh, Jesus, when they were crucifying him, he was silent as if he felt no pain. So that doesn't work with the early church because for the early church, at least the early Pauline church, Jesus needs to suffer. It really needs to hurt. Uh, you know, his pain is our gain, as they say. Uh, it's the most painful death ever. He's bearing the sins of the world. He's smitten and afflicted. He's bruised for our iniquities. He's crushed for our transgressions, as Isaiah chapter 3, 53 says, which Christians believe to be referencing Jesus. So it seems like in the Gospel of Peter, he's just... He's not feeling pain, or perhaps his soul has left his body. They're crucifying an empty shell. Something's going on there. The church didn't like it. So the Gospel of Peter is rejected, but the Gospel of Mark, who's, who's Peter's student, is accepted, right, as canonical. Um, and then the Gospel of John. Um, there's good reasons for placing John around 70 or even earlier as well, but the vast majority of historians place the Gospel of John uh, anywhere from about 90 to 110 of the Common Era. If we just take the low number, right, the earliest date of 90, right, um, uh, it's, uh, that's called the terminus post quem, right, the earliest of date, uh, 90. So let's, you know, Gospel, the, 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 the Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel, was probably, let's say he was, I don't know, 30 years old uh, at the crucifixion, around the age of Jesus, probably the same age, right? They, the disciples were probably not old men. They were probably young men around the age of Jesus. So he's 30 years old, right, in the year 30. Um, so he waited then 
60 years, right, to write his gospel around 90. Again, we're taking the low end date of 90. So he's 90 years old, right, and he's writing this gospel. And he's writing it in Greek, and it's quite sophisticated Greek. And John, the son of Zebedee, is supposed to be a Galilean fisherman. And uh, 95%, probably, of, of people in Palestine at the time, certainly you know, fishermen and peasants, they were illiterate. They could not read or write. Or they were unlettered. Uh, so how is it that he can produce this gospel where he's talking about or referencing the Logos, which is a uh, Hellenistic philosophical idea that goes back to Heraclitus. Maybe he studied for 60 years, but it still doesn't make a lot of sense that he would write it in Greek and not in Aramaic or in Syriac. Another issue is that in John, so if you ask a Christian, where does Jesus claim to be God in the New Testament, in the four Gospels, right? Invariably, the Christian will quote something from the Gospel of John, right? It is the highest Christology. So a Christian would say, well, John 10.30, the Father and I are one. There you go. Uh, John 8.58, <clears throat> before Abraham was, I am, right? So print. Uh, print Abraham geneste ego emmi, right? Present tense. Before Abraham was, I am. I already was before Abraham. So here Jesus, he's intimating his pre eternality. Right? He predates Abraham. Um, or they'll say, um, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? John 14, 6. So you have these I am statements. That's what these are called. The famous I am statements of the Johannine or Gospel of John, the Johannine Gospel. We find none of these I am statements in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, these three Gospels, which are called the synoptic Gospels, right? Synoptic meaning one eyed. Basically, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they follow basically the same chronology of events uh, in the life of Jesus. Whereas in John, we have this uh, drastic departure. Uh, from the synoptic chronology, not only in chronology, but in content. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the preferred method of teaching, his preferred uh, pedagogical method of teaching is through parable. But in John, <clears throat> he is giving these very long uh, monologues about his relationship with the Father, making big, big claims. He's, he's engaged in these long and uh, sometimes uh, very uh, tense debates with uh, the Jews, as it says, right? The Jews. That, I mean, it's very clear in the Gospel of John that the enemies of Jesus are not scribes and Pharisees, right? I mean, you find that language in Matthew, which is written around 70 or 80, 85. But by the time John comes around, there's a, there's a clear departure. You have Christians and you have Jews, right? Uh, in, in earliest of Christianity, the, the Christians uh, were a sect of Judaism. They're called the Nutzrim, or the Nazareans, or the Evyonim, which means like the spiritual paupers, the poor people. But now we have a definitive uh, split in the late first century. These are Jews. So it's very clear if you read the Gospel of John, hoi iudaioi, right? The Jews are the enemies uh, of Jesus. And Jesus is always butting heads with the Jews. So it's very, very interesting. Um, but the main point I was going to make is that these I am statements, which are supposed to be divine claims of Jesus, Jesus is claiming to be God in these I am statements. If he truly made these statements, then we really have to sort of give an F to Matthew, Mark, and Luke for how they wrote their Gospels. You know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke mention, all three of them mention, that Jesus, he rode a donkey into Jerusalem. When he came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he rode a donkey into Jerusalem. All three of them mention that, right? You might think, well, is that really important? Apparently, there's something in the book of Zechariah or Zephaniah that says, you know, the king of Zion comes to you seated humbly upon a donkey. So it's a fulfillment of prophecy. Okay, 
still doesn't seem very important, but if Jesus is making a divine claim, he's claiming to be God. He said, before Abraham was, I am, the Father and I are one. Uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. Right? These big, big claims that he's making in the Gospel of John, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke 100% failed in recording these divine claims. How could they not record these divine claims of Jesus? So the answer is, they're completely inept, and they've done a horrible job at writing their Gospels. Or, uh, Jesus never made those statements. Right? And uh, the majority of historians nowadays, uh, they believe that the latter is actually true, that the Gospel of John is really a, a, an ahistorical document. It's really just sort of a Christological meditation of a certain community of Christians called the Johannine community. Um, and you know this, this community, if, if you read the Gospel of John, for example, he, uh, and he's aware that you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke floating around um, in, the, in, in the Mediterranean, but he at times deliberately contradicts the synoptics. Right? For example, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it says Jesus was crucified on uh, the day of Passover, which is a strange day to be crucified. Uh, but John says that he was crucified on the eve of Passover. So the question then becomes, who's right? Can they both be right? Were there two crucifixions? How can these texts be inerrant? Right? And this is the position of like uh, fundamentalist Bible colleges like the Moody Bible Institute, probably Liberty University, Oral Roberts University, that these books are inerrant. How can both of these be true? Was Jesus crucified on Passover or the eve of Passover? Which is it? Were there two crucifixions? Somebody got it wrong. Or they both got it wrong. Right? Um, it says in the Synoptic Gospels that when Jesus was um, going to be crucified, for no apparent reason, the Romans pulled a random guy out of the crowd named Simon of Cyrene and compelled him to bear the cross, right? So he took the cross of Jesus, or probably the cross beam. It says staros, which is like a, a stake or a beam, uh, probably just a crossbar, um, and made him bear the cross while Jesus sort of just followed in front or, in, or behind, I don't remember uh, what it says in the synoptics, but that's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John knows this, but John goes out of his way to contradict the synoptics and he says, Jesus bore his own cross to Golgotha, the place of the skull where the Romans used to crucify Jews, insurrectionist uh, Jews or troublemaking Jews. So why does John do that? Right? Well, there's probably some sort of Christological or polemical reason why he does that. Now, we know that there were early Christian groups that denied the crucifixion of Jesus. One such group was the, were the Basilidians, named after Basilides. I might have mentioned him in the past. He was a Christian teacher in, in Egypt, Alexandria, in the first quarter of the second century. And Basilides, uh, his uh, opinion was that Simon of Cyrene was transfigured, right, he uses that word in Latin, transfiguratum, transfigured to look like Jesus, uh, and Jesus to made, was transfigured to look like him, and so the Romans grabbed you know, the apparent Jesus. So this is called substitution theory, supernatural identity transference, um, and so Jesus was able to escape the crucifixion. So uh, it seems like John is familiar with this belief around the time when he's writing at 90 uh, CE or at 100 CE, possibly 110 CE. So what he does is he completely eliminates the entire episode of Simon of Cyrene for a Christological reason. Even though he knows he's contradicting the synoptics, and even though his readers will eventually know that he's contradicting the synoptics, right? But his whole point is to teach you, is, is not to give you accurate history, 
John admits at the end of the gospel, these things have been written to convince you that Jesus is the Son of God. Right? That's the whole aim. That's the telos. That's his maqsad of writing his gospel, is to convince you by any means necessary that Jesus is the Son of God. Right? And that he died for your sins. So don't get it twisted. He wasn't substituted. He died on the cross. And then John tells us something else at the crucifixion scene. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we're told that Jesus is on the cross for a few hours. And Mark, it's maybe three hours. And this is why Pilate marveled, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. This man has died already after just a few hours on the cross. Pontius Pilate made a career of crucifying Jews. So if he's astonished and he's, and he's marveling that this man has died already, then there's something happening there. There's something to look into. How can he be dead already? And of course, Christians will say that, well, Jesus, you know, he was beaten beyond recognition and, uh, you know, he was flogged front and back down to his bowels. I mean, his intestines were falling out. You read things like this in, 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 in Christian polemical writings like by Joshua McDowell and, uh, and others, um, Mike Lacona and things like that. Uh, so he's just, you know, he's a bloody, bloody mess. You know, he's going into, uh, his body's going into shock and, and so three hours, I'm surprised he even lasted uh, three hours. Why is Pilate shocked? Pilate is an expert Jew killer. He is an expert Jew crucifier. And he is, it says he marveled. This man is dead after three hours? Are you sure he's dead? How can he be dead? And he oversaw all of you know, these uh, so-called beatings and floggings and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, nowhere in Matthew, Mark, and Luke does it say that he was nailed to a cross, right? That's not mentioned in the synoptic tradition. Uh, we find that in John, and it's not mentioned directly. It's when, you know, in, in the upper room where, the, you know, the doubting Thomas and Jesus shows his hands, you know, and his feet, apparently the marks of the, the crucifixion. So we find that in John, right? But something else that happens in John is Jesus is on the cross, and he's impaled on the cross. We don't find this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Why didn't Matthew, Mark, and Luke? If Matthew is an eyewitness, this is what Christians believe, at least traditional Christians. Matthew is an eyewitness of the ministry of Jesus, right? Um, why didn't Matthew? We say, well, he, he forsook Jesus and fled. I mean, that's what it says in Matthew, Mark, and Luke when Jesus was on the, it was in the, uh, on the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Jewish... Um, a temple guard came to arrest him, and as all of his disciples forsook, forsook him and fled. So Matthew wasn't there. Okay, but Matthew could have, there were, there were people that were there. Matthew could have interviewed somebody, an eyewitness, and how, what happened at the crucifixion? And Matthew seems to know a lot about what happened at the crucifixion, even though he wasn't there. Matthew records the final words of Jesus on the cross. How did he know that? Somebody told him. Why didn't somebody tell him that Jesus was impaled on the cross? John, that's what John says, writing in 90 or 100. Well, it probably didn't happen. That's why. It's not historical. Why does John say that Jesus was impaled on the cross? Because apparently there might have been Christians who had the belief that Jesus was put on a cross, but he didn't actually die. He might have swooned. He might have survived the cross. Right? Um, that's, that's why he was seen alive in his fleshy body after the supposed, his supposed death. Well, John eliminates this type of uh, heresy, according to him, and says, no, 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 don't get it twisted. He was impaled on the cross. He's dead. There's no doubt about it. All right? <clears throat> so basically, okay. So went a little bit off course here. Um, but that's okay. So, we said that there's four Gospels, there's the book of Acts, there's uh, 21 epistles, and then we have one apocalypse, right? Apocalypse is a Greek word, um, apocalypse, uh, meaning uh, an, a, 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 an unveiling or a disclosure, kashf, it's called kitabul mukashaf, and this is sort of a book that describes visions of the eschaton, the sa'a, towards the end of time. 
Uh, it's very, very cryptic. It's very symbolic. Very, very strange. Very enigmatic. I mean, you have you know, the four horsemen, and you have you know, the lake of fire. and It's a very strange book. You have the mark of the beast, uh, the mark of the therion in Greek, um, which is 666. It's stated in Revelation uh, chapter 13, verse 18. So this book is called the Book of Revelation. Right? In the Catholic version, it's called the Apocalypse. You have all these strange things happening. The mark of the beast, the Antichrist, is 666. Nobody knows what that means. Some people believe it's the numerical value of his name. Some scholars believe that it's a reference to Nero, the, um, the Roman uh, emperor who, um, was com who, who uh, was compared today by Bernie Sanders to Donald Trump. Um, he said, I think he said, Sanders said today, what did he say? He said, when Rome was burning, uh, Nero uh, was, was playing his fiddle, but Trump was golfing, uh, right? Um, so Nero is sort of seen as this, this, um, this sort of prototypical, horrible leader, right? Um, so some scholars believe that the numerical value of Emperor Nero is 666. Okay. So you have these 27 books. Okay. Now, the first books of the New Testament to be written were not the Gospels. Okay. The first books chronologically of the New Testament were uh, the Pauline epistles. Right? The letters written by Paul. So who is Paul? So Paul, his actual name is Saul of Tarsus. He was a Benjaminite Jew from Sicily who was also a Pharisee who early on was a very zealous Christian persecuting Pharisee. So he would persecute the earliest of Christians, like the disciples, right? Before they were actually called Christian, uh, they, were, they were the Nazarenes. Right, so Jews who happened to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, Paul was the uh, the man that the, the high priest would call upon to, um, according to his own words, he would bind them up, capture them, and bring them back uh, to Jerusalem for for trial. So he was a persecutor of the early Jesus um, movement, um, and then according to Paul. Uh, he had some sort of uh, conversion experience uh, on the road to Damascus where he claims that he had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus who commissioned him to go into all nations and admonish the Gentiles. Right? So he's the apostle to the Gentiles. So then Paul goes to different major metropolitan areas around the Mediterranean and he begins to preach what he calls my gospel. That's what he says. My gospel. Remember Jesus of the seed of David uh, rose from the dead according to my gospel, he says. And he uses that phrase three times in his, in his, um, in his letters. Two of them are genuinely written by Paul. One of them is pseudo-Paul. So when Paul says my gospel, it seems like he's making a distinction between what he is saying and what this other gospel is saying. And he actually says that in the book of Galatians, he chastises his congregation in Galatia, which is in Turkey, for believing in, quote, another gospel. So there's another gospel. And, um, according to Christian historians, the story is this. Paul went to Galatia, and he made a lot of converts to his gospel, his understanding of the gospel, uh, that Jesus was the divine son of God and that he died for your sins. Um, and that's the new that's the new covenant, and uh, and and then he left Galatia, and then a group of apostles from Jerusalem sent by James, who is Jesus's brother or cousin. It's not really clear what brother means, half brother or cousin, possibly step brother. Nonetheless, the book of Acts tells us that James is the leader of the Jerusalem apostles. He sends messengers other apostles, into Galatia 
to correct Paul's deviant teachings. Right? And so they're able to convince these Galatians um, that Paul was wrong about many fundamental uh, issues. So then Paul writes now the book of Gal the, his letter to the Galatians, where he chastises the Galatians. How dare you believe in this other gospel? Right? We didn't bring this gospel. And then he goes on to accuse uh, Peter, James, and Barnabas of hypocrisy in the book of Galatians. So Paul is butting heads. He has fundamental big issues with actual disciples of Isa alayhi salam. He admits this in the book of Galatians. He refers to them sarcastically, so-called pillars. That's what he says, these so-called pillars of the church. He says, these, these super apostles. You know, who do they think they are, these super apostles? This is his sarcasm. Who is he talking about? He's talking about actual disciples of Isa alayhi salam. He says, I don't need a letter of recommendation. You know, I have my, I, I, I have my experience. I experienced the resurrected Jesus. What does he mean, I, I don't need a letter of recommendation? According to New Testament scholars, these apostles that are coming into these cities in Paul's wake, and correcting his deviant gospel, have actual ijazat. They have these <laughs> teaching licenses that they've brought from Jerusalem, signed by James, who is the leader of the Nazarenes, the early Christian movement. Paul has no such letter because he's a freelance, self-appointed apostle. So he says to his congregations, I don't need a letter. I had this experience. And, he's, and he brags, I, don't, I didn't take this teaching from any human being, from any man. I took it directly from Christ. This is what he says. Yet he is at odds. Big time. Fundamental issues. He's butting heads with the actual disciples of Isa alayhi salam. All right? So Paul is a highly problematic person, to say the least. Um, so... So then, so Paul began writing around 52. His, his first letter was to his congregation at Thessalonica, a major Greek city, right? It's called First Thessalonians. And in First Thessalonians, Paul is very clear. And there's certain central Pauline themes. This is how scholars, like textual critics, can tell if this is written by Paul or not. So you have these 14. Uh, epistles that are claimed to have been written by Paul. According to historians, seven of them are by Paul because they, you know, they, 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 they would um, analyze the text through certain textual measures. And the other seven are deemed to be forgeries in the name of Paul. Right? So the seven genuine letters, the first genuine letter is called 1 Thessalonians. And then you have uh, Galatians, Philemon, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Philippians, and Romans. And in these seven letters, you have these central Pauline themes. The second coming of Jesus will be in his lifetime. This is absolutely fundamental to Paul's understanding of his gospel, what he is claiming he has taken from Jesus. F absolutely fundamental. We're going to be uh, transformed in the twinkling of an eye, he says in 1 Thessalonians, caught up in the clouds with the Lord. And all of his advice on marriage, celibacy, on commerce, all of it is predicated upon his belief that at any moment, Jesus will manifest in his second coming and set up his kingdom of God on earth, right? As, as the Jews believe the Jewish Messiah would do, right? And of course, this never happened. It never happened, you know. So we have here a, uh, a, a, a falsifiable claim of Paul. Paul is very, very clear. He believes the second coming will occur in his lifetime. In fact, the author of Mark's gospel and these four gospels so you have the Pauline letters that are written between you know, 
52 and 65 or something. And then you have the first gospel, Mark. So the four gospels are highly influenced by Pauline doctrine, right? And again, that's why in these four gospels, I mean, they're basically four extended passion narratives because the cross is so central for Paul. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, if Christ is not raised, our faith is in vain. If Christ did not raise from the dead, if he was not resurrected, our faith is in vain. There's no point to this religion, right? So you can see how Christians are uh, um, oftentimes offended by the Muslim suggestion uh, that Isa alayhi salam was never crucified. He's never crucified, he's never killed, he's never resurrected, and Christianity is in vain. But this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. So now in Mark, right, you have Jesus saying that among those standing here, right, he says, uh, there are some standing here that shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, right? And for Mark, the Son of Man seems to be uh, a, a, um, uh, a, a title of Jesus himself. Coming in the clouds, he's paraphrasing something found in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, the apocalyptic Son of Man, which Christians, or Mark at this point, believes to be uh, a prophecy of the Jewish Messiah, the Bar Inash, the Son of Man, who is exceedingly powerful on the earth. Jesus is saying there's some standing here. He's telling this to Jews around 29 or 30 of the common era. There are people here now alive that will see me coming with great power in the clouds. Now, we cannot possibly attribute such a statement to Isa alayhi salam because that would make him a false prophet. And true prophets do not make false prophecies. Right? Christians have ways of sort of working around these things. Uh, but what's very interesting is Mark wrote that around 70. So he's, you know, he's taking a big risk because, <laughs> you know, if, if there are few people alive in the generation of Jesus around 70 of the common era. But it seems like Mark believes because, because of what's happening in Jerusalem around the time of Mark's composition, Mark believes it is the end of the world. What's happening in Jerusalem between 67 and 73? It's the Jewish war that Josephus writes about. So you have an all-out assault uh, uh, upon the Jews in Palestine by the Roman war machine. Right? So there was an insurrection by the, uh, the Qana'im, the, um, the zealots or the proto-zealots. Uh, these were Jewish insurrectionists that tried to seize the land um, and implement Jewish law from the heathen colonizers, the Romans. They were absolutely crushed over this six-year period. The Romans started in the north in Galilee, where Jesus was raised, and they just swept right down the entire country, destroyed the temple in 70, and massacred um, you know, men, women, and children. The, you have that mass uh, suicide that happened at the fortress in Masada around 73 of the Common Era. So Mark believes this is the end of the world, right? So if this is the end of the world, then the second coming of Jesus is imminent, so he has no problem saying, putting the words into the mouth of Jesus, there are some standing here that shall not taste death until, until they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power. All right? We would not attribute this false prophecy to a true prophet, Isa alayhi salam, Mark is influenced by Paul, who made this false prophecy. Paul believed the second coming was imminent. It did not materialize. Paul also believes in justification by faith alone. He believes that the law of Moses was abrogated um, almost completely. And he believes in uh, vicarious atonement, this idea that Jesus was a savior man-god, a divine son of God who died for your sins, right? Um, what's also interesting about Paul 
is that he does not mention anything about the historical Jesus. Paul does not quote Jesus accurately one time in any of his letters, whether they're genuine Paul or pseudo-Paul. Paul never mentions a miracle of, that Jesus performed, like these exorcisms that are such a big part of the synoptic tradition, the healings, right? Uh, the resurrection of Lazarus. He doesn't mention any of these things. Paul does not mention anything about the historical Jesus. He's completely focused on the crucifixion and resurrection, the significance of the death of a savior man God. That's what his attention is almost exclusively focused on. Right? He doesn't mention the virgin birth of Jesus. Why wouldn't he mention that? Very, very strange. He actually says Jesus, who was of the seed of David, I mean, it seems like he believes that Jesus was just born um, as a descendant of David in the conventional sense. Right? Why wouldn't he mention these things? He doesn't quote Isa alayhi salam. He doesn't quote the Jesus of the Gospels. If there's an oral tradition floating around where Jesus is making divine claims that are recorded by John, Paul doesn't seem to quote it. He doesn't quote them. Why doesn't he quote them? He, either he doesn't care that Jesus claimed to be God, and I think he would care, or these statements did not exist. And John invented them out of whole cloth in order to convince his audience that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, Paul does something quite radical. What he does is he appropriates an old pagan motif. Okay, this is known as the dying and rising savior man god motif. So, this was a motif, a belief that predated Christianity by hundreds and hundreds of years. This idea that some sort of incarnation, a divine son of God, comes to the earth, suffers and dies for the sins of humanity. It's a very beautiful story. You have a personal savior, right? What Paul does is that he gives it a Jewish makeover. And he uses it to explain what he believes to be the gospel. Right? So what Paul basically does, I liken it to like a Christmas tree. A Christmas tree, right? So you have this tree which is brought into the home, which is what the ancient pagans used to do. I mean, in Jeremiah, I think, chapter 10, verse 2, he says, imitate not the way of the heathen, the infidel, who brings a tree into their house and decks it out with gold and silver. That's what the tree worshipers used to do. Today we call them tree huggers. No, I'm just kidding. But that's what they used to do, right? What Paul is doing is basically he's taking a tree, a Christmas tree, a, a symbol of paganism, that's his foundation, and he's putting a Star of David at the top of it. Right? So he takes paganisms, he takes paganism as his foundation, and he kind of dresses it up with the trappings of Judaism. Before Christianity, you had Osiris, the savior man god of Egypt. Adonis of Syria, Romulus of Rome, Zalmoxis of Thrace, who's mentioned by Herodotus in his histories, Inanna of Sumeria, who's a female daughter of God, and of course Mithras, the Persian sun god, who although he didn't actually die, he did suffer for the sins of his people. Um, there's a book called The World the World's 16 Crucified Saviors by Kersey Graves, written in 1875. Uh, there are some problematic elements to this book from a historical standpoint, but it's an interesting book. Um, Christianity Before Christ is the subtitle. There's another book by Tom Harper called The Pagan Christ, which is quite interesting uh, as well. So Osiris, Adonis, Romulus, Almoxus, Inanna, Mithras, all savior gods, all sons of God, with the exception of Inanna, who's a daughter of God, but basically all, you know, all children of God, but not the God. They are not the God, right? So all of these traditions are what's known as henotheistic. 
And I am convinced that Paul himself was a henotheist. I do not believe that Paul is a monotheist. Right? Paul believes that Jesus is a second deity. Paul is highly, highly influenced by Hellenistic philosophy, Hellenistic motifs like this one here, the dying and rising savior man god motif, but also this idea of, you know, this middle platonic idea that the Godhead is three um, unique deities um, where there's a hierarchy of being the one, the word, the logos, and the spirit, right? All three are divine. The latter two are the effect of the cause who is the one. He's the, 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 the source and origin of everything, even the, the, the logos and the spirit. So even though the logos and spirit are from the very essence, they're ex deo, they're from the very essence of God, they are not as exalted as the one who is without origin, right? Who is the origin and, uh, and is the, the cause of the others. So you have this hierarchy of gods, right? So Paul is borrowing this idea. So is John. John directly calls Jesus the logos. Right? So it's hard to, it's very difficult. I mean, eventually, Christian apologists in the third and fourth century, they had a way of sort of working out how this is still monotheism. It's not monotheism according to the Islamic definition of monotheism, uh, but they, they sort of took these middle Platonic and Neoplatonic ideas of a hierarchy of, God, uh, of, of a hierarchy within the Godhead and said there's really no hierarchy of being, just of person. So a kind of sleight of hand. We'll talk about that uh, next week, um, inshallah ta'ala. But anyway, you have the savior man gods. They all undergo a passion, some sort of suffering, and they obtain victory over death. It's very interesting. You know, the Quran says that the Christians say, Al-Masih ibn Allah, that Christ is the son of God. That is a saying that issues from their mouths. In this they but imitate what the unbelievers of all these ancient pagans used to say. It's all the way back hundreds and hundreds of years. And of course, Hellenistic religion tended to be syn syncretistic. right? They would mix and match different elements. So like the cult of Mithras was an amalgamation of Hellenistic, meaning Greek, as well as Persian beliefs. The cult of Dionysus was an amalgamation of Hellenistic as well as Phoenician beliefs. The cult of um, uh, Pauline Christianity is an amalgamation of Hellenistic and Jewish beliefs. So now you have this kind of new hybrid religion. And when that happened, now you have this definitive split. Paul set the foundation, right, in the middle of the first century. By the end of the first century, you have this definitive split. These are not Jews. These are a separate religion. They're called Christians. They worship Christ as a god, right? So that's... Um, so you have these 27 books then, just to uh, wrap up, inshallah. Four Gospels, one Book of Acts, 21 Epistles, one, um, one Apocalypse. Okay. Um, I think that's uh, good for tonight, inshallah. So we will see you next time. Uh, I think that's a good place to stop. I don't want to start a new, I know there's a few minutes left here, but I don't want to get into a new topic. This is going to take a bit of explaining to do. Uh, so we'll save that for next time. We'll talk, uh, we'll finish our discussion on the Gospels. There's one more thing I wanted to say about, about what's known as uh, backward Christology, which is very, very interesting that we find in the four Gospels, Christology in the making, James Dunn, this idea. We'll talk about that and then we'll go into the Nicene Creed and talk about uh, the Trinity, inshallah. Um, so this is our uh, final session on Christianity. Um, so last time we talked about <clears throat> the four Gospels and something of the 
Christology. Christology is an academic term, uh, meaning uh, belief about Christ. We talked about the Christology that's found in each gospel. Um, historians have noticed that uh, through the years, the Christology of, of the Christians uh, has um, become higher and higher So, in, 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 throughout the Gospels. So in the Gospel of Mark, <clears throat> Jesus is, peace be upon him, according to Mark, he is a, uh, a prophet. He is the hidden Messiah. He is, um, uh, it's a very, very short Gospel. Um, his statements are very brief. And then in Matthew, he is now the uh, open Messiah. Um, uh, he fulfills all of these prophecies of the Old Testament. Uh, many times Matthew um, takes a lot of liberties as to how he's um, uh, interpreting Old Testament um, uh, stories and texts and applying them to Jesus. It seems at times he is simply uh, making things up. For example, he says, in, uh, in, at the beginning, towards the beginning of his gospel, that because Jesus came from Nazareth, this is so that it might be fulfilled what was, what was written by the prophet, he shall be called a Nazarene. He shall be called a Nazarene. Matthew is presenting the statement as if it's from the Old Testament, from the Tanakh, but there's no such statement in the Old Testament. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is called Soter in Greek, which means Savior. Um, uh, although there's different ways of understanding that term in Luke. <clears throat> but the main thing about Luke is Jesus becomes now this universal messenger, um, universal prophet. Uh, Jesus becomes this sort of quasi-Aristotelian uh, philosopher um, where he is um, expounding uh, truths through uh, parable. I mean, we get some of that obviously in Matthew and Mark as well, but especially in Luke, because Luke is trying to appeal to a Gentile audience, a Greco-Roman audience. And then finally, in the Gospel of John, Jesus is called the Word, the Logos, um, the Word made flesh, <clears throat> a divine incarnation. Um, so uh, today then, we're going to look at the Nicene Creed. This is an Orthodox Christian creed. Uh, when I say Orthodox, I'm talking about Trinitarian Christianity. Um, and this creed was ratified in the early fourth century of the Common Era, uh, following the Council of Nicaea in 325 of the Common Era. Before the Council of Nicaea, you have um, many different types of Christians many different types of Christianities, uh, too numerous to even mention here. It would take a seminar to mention what was happening uh, in the first uh, three or four centuries of the Christian era with the Christian religion. You had Christians who believed that Isa salam, that Jesus, peace be upon him, was only a human. You had other Christians who believed that he was only God. You have Christians who believe that he was one of many gods. You have Christians who believe that he was the only God. You have Christians uh, who believed that he didn't have a physical body. He was a phantasm. There were Christians who believed that he was both divine and human. You had Christians who believed that not only was he both divine and human, that he became divine at his birth. There were Christians who believed that he became divine at his baptism. There were Christians who believed that he became divine at his resurrection. It's called exaltation Christology. Yet Christians who believed that he was always divine, right? That he was the pre-existent or pre-eternal son, that he was the logos. Again, this is a Greek idea. You had Christians who believed that there were three gods. You had Christians who believed there was one God, but this God had three different modes, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's like God putting on three different masks. One person of God who has sort of three modes. So he was the Father, and then he became, totally became the Son, 
and then he becomes the spirit, resurrects the son, he becomes the son again, and then he becomes the father again. This type of Christology is called modal monarchianism or Sabellianism. <clears throat> so you have uh, many, many types of Christianity. Now, Constantine, who was the first Christian emperor, he wanted uh, unity in his empire. And so after defeating his rivals to the throne, he called for this council, the Council of Nicaea. Very important council, 325 of the Common Era. The first so-called ecumenical world church council. Although all of the bishops that attended Nicaea believed already that Jesus, some uh, peace be upon him, was divine in some way, right? Um, although that is debatable, but certainly there were no Ebunites present at the council, you know, Nazarenes. They weren't any Jewish Christians that were at the council. The Jewish Christians uh, were all extinct by this time, and, and if they were still uh, practicing, and there were pockets of them, they certainly were not going to be invited to the Council of Nicaea. So it's not really an ecumenical or universal or world church council. So Constantine called for this, uh, this council, and there's a lot of um, sort of misinformation as to what actually happened <clears throat> at this council. Dan Brown wrote a book called The Da Vinci Code, in which he is, uh, gives a lot of false information as to what happened. But at the end of the council, and, and whether Constantine was actually Christian or not during this council is actually open to debate. It's, it's not clear. Certainly his mother was Christian. His mother was a very hardcore Christian. But uh, it seems like Constantine called the council for more political reasons. He wanted unity in the empire. So at the end of the council, uh, after deliberations upon deliberations, the bishops draft this creed. And it's a short creed, so we'll just go through it. The creedal exposition of the 318 fathers. Right? That means the bishops that attended the council. <clears throat> so <clears throat> they say, and it begins, and it's written in Greek, right? Um, whether Isa alayhi salam spoke Greek or not is open to debate. Um, it seems like he probably knew some Greek uh, because it was the lingua franca um, of the Mediterranean at the time. Uh, so um, the New Testament uh, documents, the New Testament books are all written in Greek, and those are original documents, originally written in Greek. Paul wrote his letters in Greek. He did not write them in Syriac or Hebrew. Right? The, the original documents are in Greek. So Isa alayhi salam, you know, he, he grew up in a very eclectic environment in the north of Palestine, in a province called Galilee. So no doubt he knew Hebrew. That was a language of the synagogue liturgy. He was a rabbi. You have to know Hebrew. It's like being a sheikh today and not knowing Arabic. Doesn't make any sense. Or just being an alim and not knowing, uh, not knowing Arabic. So he knew Hebrew. He knew Aramaic or Syriac. Syriac is sort of late. Aramaic, or sometimes called Christian Aramaic. It's related Semitic language, related to Hebrew and Arabic, the language of the sort of masses, right? The sort of uh, Amiya. So he certainly knew that as well. Um, he probably knew some Latin, which was the official language of the Roman Empire. And of course, Palestine at the time was a colony of Rome. And then um, and then Greek as well, which was widely spoken in that area. Even uh, the Romans adopted uh, Greek uh, in that area in the Middle East, in the ancient Near East. So the Romans spoke Latin and Greek. So Isa alayhi salam and many of the Jews at the time <clears throat> probably spoke Greek as well. Uh, <clears throat> but since the New Testament was written in Greek, in Koine Greek, which is also called Alexandrian Greek, so this is the language of Alexander. So don't forget what Alexander did is that he conquered um, all of North Africa and, and the ancient Near East during his time. And his 
influence in that region was still very much alive in the first century of the Common Era. It's called Hellenization, right? Greek influence in all spheres of life and many disciplines, including theology and philosophy, but also cultural aspects, right? Linguistic aspects, very heavy uh, um, influence. <clears throat> so the creed begins like this. And um, if you're watching live, you can feel free to ask questions, inshallah, in the chat box, and I will get to them, inshallah. It begins by saying, Pisteu <clears throat> amen, we believe, eis henatheon patera pantokratora. So that's the Greek. It says, we believe. That's how the, the creed begins. We believe in one God, the Father. Pantokratora means the pantocrator, the sort of creator of all. Sometimes that's translated as the almighty. Um, in, the Latin says, credimus uh, in unum deum patrem omnipotent. So they translate panto, uh, uh, pantocrator, pantocratora, as basically omnipotent. And that's why we get the English almighty. So the Father, we believe in one God, the Father, <clears throat> the creator of all. It continues, the maker of all things seen and unseen. And we believe, he says, or they say, Eis hena kurian iesun kriston, ton huian tu theu. We also believe in one Lord. Kurian means Lord in Greek. Now this word Lord uh, is a tricky word <clears throat> because the word Lord can apply to both God and man in New Testament Greek, right? Um, Philip in the Gospel of John, somebody comes to Philip and says, Kurie, Kurie. Right? Lord, Lord. Now, Philip is certainly not God. Philip was a disciple of Jesus. But in the creed, the fathers don't mean it like that. The fathers mean to say that Jesus is God. He is divine. Right? So it's important for us when reading this creed that we understand these terms as they were understood, how they were understood at the time they were written. So we have to be a bit of an originalist when it comes to these creeds. Right? Just as <clears throat> when we read things in the New Testament, <clears throat> when Isa alayhi salam is called Lord, Kurias, in Matthew, for example, you can make a good case that Jews are not referring to Jesus as Lord God. Why would a Jew do that? A Jew comes to Jesus, Kurie, Kurie, my, the Lord God, Lord God. All right? That's, that's kufr, that's apostasy. A Jew would not do that. So <clears throat> looking at the sort of context, the social location of Isa alayhi salam himself, the word is a bit ambiguous. Kurie can simply mean master or even rabbi. Even the word rabbi, rabbi, right, means my lord, right? Uh, you know, Rabbi Shmuley Botak, you know, he, he's not the Lord God. When people refer to him as rab, rabbi, rabbi, they mean to say master, teacher, right? Uh, but here in the creed, they're taking kurias to be a divine title. And we believe in one, in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's what they say here. The Son of God. And then it says, genethenta ectu patros monogene, which means begotten from the Father uniquely. And they say this is from the essence of the Father. Right? This is from the usias tu patros. So what does it mean then, Jesus is the Son of God, according to Trinitarian Christianity? What do Trinitarians mean by that? It's important for us not to build a straw man and say, oh, Christians believe that, when, that, that uh, God had relations with Mary, physical relations, and Jesus was uh, the offspring of God and Mary in that, in that physical sense. That's not what Christians believe, at least not what Trinitarian Christians believe. Mormons, on the other hand, do believe that, but Mormonism is uh, a very strange form of Christianity, if we can even call it Christianity. Certainly, Orthodox Christians, whether they're Eastern Orthodox or Protestant or Catholic, uh, would probably not consider Mormons to be true Christians <coughs> any more than they would consider Muslims to be Christians. Um, but what they mean by Son of God is that the Father generated 
the Son, so we have to be careful about our language, generated, not created. The Son of God was not created. That's a heresy. Right? That was uh, Arius' position, who was also at the Council of Nicaea, by the way. And whether Arius believed that Jesus or the Son was a, a semi-deity somehow is open to debate. But certainly, from what has survived from his writings and what we can take from his opponents, um, albeit with a grain of salt, it seems as though Arius believed uh, that the, the Son of God was created by the Father. So that's not the Trinitarian position. The Trinitarian position is that when they say Jesus is the Son of God, or when they say we believe in the Son of God, right? Uh, that the meaning of that is that God generated or caused the Son to be from his very essence. Right? From the usias to patras, as it says in the creed. So God did not, so the Father did not create the Son out of nothing, ex nihilo. Right? That's a heresy. The Father created the world out of nothing. But the Father generated or begot, that's the term they use, begot, which of course has a lot of baggage to it. Because we think, okay, this Father begot this Son and this this man begot this, this child. So we, we sort of take it in this physical sense, but it's not meant to be taken physically, right? That God generated the Son from his own being, and this was done in pre-eternality. This is their position. So in other words, there was never a time when the Father was sort of alone by himself, and then the Son came after him. There's no before or after. This is in pre-eternality. There is no time when this happened. Even my language cannot cap, because I'm saying when this, there's no when, when this happened, right? So this is their position. He's the son of God in the sense that he shares an essential essence, right? Essence is called that in Arabic. You know, we say in our theology, no one shares with Allah's that, his essence, his sifat, his uh, attributes, and his af'al. No one can do the actions of God. Right? Whereas the Christians say, no, God shares. God is three persons, and these, these three persons share God's essence, actions, and attributes. One God, but three persons. Right? The essence of the Son is identical to the essence of the Father, but they're different persons. What does it mean to be a different person? Meaning they have different attributes. Right? For example, the Son has the attribute of begottenness. He's an effect of the Father who is his cause. So the Father has uncausation, the Son is caused, but they're equal in essence because the Father generated or produced the Son from his very own essence. This is their position. Um, <clears throat> uh, obviously, they're, they're very problematic from our perspective. The whole idea of a pre-eternal Son seems like a bit of a contradiction. Pre-eternal son. Well, the son is always an effect of a father, so it comes after, but you're saying he's pre-eternal. So pre-eternal son seems like a bit of a oxymoron. Nonetheless, this is their position. And this was to avoid this idea that, Chris, that you, like his, other Christians at the time and, other, and Jews and pagans were saying about the early Christians, you're worshiping two gods, just admit it. You're saying that this God is a son of God, he has a father, that's two gods, right? Even if this was done before time, the fact that the son is an effect of the father, the, the fact that the, the, the father is uncaused and produces a son, even if it's done in, before time, uh, in pre-eternality, uh, the fact that the father is uncaused means that he is ontologically superior to the son. <clears throat> He's a higher state of being, right? And so like a Neoplatonist or a Middle Platonist would make that argument. The Middle Platonist would also say that the one generated the Logos from his being. He's ex dio. But the Logos, uh, who's also divine, is not as divine as the one because the Logos is the effect of the one, of the cause, right? <clears throat> I think the camera just panned out. Uh, for some reason. There we go. 
Okay. <clears throat> Again, people that are watching, you can ask questions for clarification or um, questions that are uh, related to uh, this topic, inshallah. So that's what they mean by Son of God. Begotten from the Father uniquely. This is from the essence of the Father. And they continue and say, describing the Son. How do they describe the Son? Theon ek theyu, God from God. God, capital G, from God, capital G. Phos ek photos, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. There's a very famous phrase here, begotten, not made. Right? Genethenta u poiethenta in the Greek. What does it mean, begotten, not made? Meaning uh, generated or caused naturally, not created. The Son is not created. What do, I, what do I mean when I say the Son? Am I talking about Jesus of Nazareth? No, I'm not talking about Jesus. Jesus was created. Jesus was a human being. That's not the Christian. The Christians are not saying that Jesus is uncreated. Right? Jesus was a human being. We're talking about the Son of God that incarnated into Jesus of Nazareth. The essence that dwelt within uh, the flesh of the man Jesus uh, is pre-eternal, is God. This is their position. right? <clears throat> so the Son was not willed into existence. right? That's Judaism. right? That, that, that God chooses and wills something to exist. Whenever he decrees a matter, he merely says to it be, and it is. Right? That's not what happened with the son. He wasn't willed into existence. And it wasn't sort of this involuntary emanation that happened. That's the sort of Neoplatonic idea. That's how the Logos in Neoplatonism and Middle Platonism came to exist, that God, the One, was sort of thinking about his own thoughts, uh, as they say, and there was an involuntary sort of spillage of light, right? And this light became the Logos, the second uh, tier of being in this hierarchy of being, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't something willed, it wasn't involuntary. They used the word naturally. The son was born just naturally from the father. What they mean is it's just who God is. God is naturally a father. He's always been a father, right? That's just who he is. God is personal. He's social. He is, he, he is in relationships, right? This type of thing. Begotten, not made. <clears throat> then they say, co-substantial with the father. <clears throat> and this is also a famous phrase, hamausian, hamausian, or homousian. So again, a little bit of uh, a Greek lesson. I don't want to get too, I didn't intend to get so technical with these classes. I was told to keep it very, very simple. Uh, but um, I, I, I don't think it's too difficult. But uh, we do have to sort of um, uh, push ourselves a little bit to get more of a substantive understanding of these things. It's still not difficult, I think. Uh, so if we look at the word, Homoousion, H H O M O, homo means same, right? Like homosexual, right? Everyone knows that word. Uh, so that's from a Greek, homo, same. Homo in Latin means man, like homo erectus, right? Like the man who stands upright, right? So that's a different language. So homoousia, so homo means same, or homo means same. Usias means uh, essence. Same essence. This is the position of the Trinitarians called Homoousian Christology. That word Homoousian is mentioned here in the Nicene Creed. It is not mentioned anywhere in the New Testament. Right? This term is so important, yet it is not mentioned in the New Testament. Now, now Christians will counter here and say, oh, yeah? Well, what's the most important theological concept in Islam? We say Tawheed. And the Christian will say, take the Quran and show me the word Tawheed in the Quran. It's not in the Quran. So the, the Christian point here is that the concept of Tawheed is in the Quran, just as the concept of Hamausian, uh, same essence Christology, is found 
in uh, the New Testament. And that's, uh, the latter obviously is open to debate um, <clears throat> uh, that um, Christians certainly take that position. Uh, the Arians certainly did not take that position. The early Christians did not take that position, or at least the Christians in the second century that did not believe that the Son was equal to the Father, they still revered these four texts. I mean, the Arians still believed in the Gospel of John. Uh, Jesus says in John 10.30, remember those I am statements we talked about last week, that logic tells us were probably never uttered by Jesus, but let's just entertain the text for now. Let's say he did say that, the Father and I are one. So Trinitarians, they say, aha, you see, the Father and I are one. They're the same essence, right? I mean, that's sort of a, 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 well, it is a giant leap to go from a statement, the Father and I are one, to saying that they're the same essence. Jesus is 100% God. He is co-substantially God. The Arians also believed in that statement. What did they, how did they interpret that statement? Well, they would look at it in its context, right? So uh, he's, Jesus is talking uh, to the Pharisees, and he's saying that, you know, the, uh, I, I'm, I'm watching over my disciples. No one can snatch them out of my hand. In other words, no one can take them out of my protection. I'm watching over them. And then he says, the Father, who is greater than all, is also watching over them. Uh, and no one can snatch them out of his hand. Ego kai pater mu hen esmen. The Father and I are one. So one in purpose, one in uh, intention, right? Not one in essence, one in, um, in, in, uh, in um, objective to protect the disciples from the enemies, right? So we would read it in its context. Um, so anyway, so you have... Uh, homoousian Christology, and then you have something homoiousian, H-O-M-O-I, just an iota in Greek. So the difference between the words homo and homoi, H-O-M-O-I, is a difference of one iota, one iota. But it makes a difference in, in theology. So homoousian Christology means that the Father and Son are exactly the same essence. Whereas Homoiousian Christology, which um, could have been the position of Arius, um, I don't think it was, but some have argued that, that the Son is similar in his essence to the Father. He's still divine, but he's not as divine as the Father, but he's still not the same. He's not like a human being, right? He's, he's sort of in this middle space. Right? So homoi means similar, hama means the same. And then, of course, you have heterousion, hetero, like, again, heterosexual. Heterousion, heteros in Greek means another, right? Another essence. And this is the position of Unitarian Christians, that the Son of God, the Son of God, that's a title, it's honorific, it's takrimi, is majaz, right, figurative. It's just a way of sort of exalting Isa alayhi salam. It's not to be taken literal in any way, shape, or form, right? And that Jesus' essence is other than God, the Father. And by Father they mean, again, the Rabb, the Lord. That's also a figurative uh, expression. Okay. And then they say here, so co-substantial with the Father, through whom all things in heaven and earth became. The one, meaning the Son, the Son of God, who for the sake of us human beings and for the sake of our salvation, came down uh, and became flesh and uh, dwelled in man, right? Enanthropesanta is the Greek, but the Latin translation says incarnatus est, right? Incarnatus, incarne. In means in, carne means flesh. Like if you ever had some chili con carne, 
chili with meat or flesh, right? So the Son of God, he descended from the metaphysical realm and incarnated into a human being, Jesus of Nazareth, 2,000 years ago, according to Trinitarian Christianity. And then they continue. Uh, became flesh and dwelled in man. We said that suffered and rose on the third day, ascended into the heavens, and will come to judge the living and the dead. Uh, so uh, belief in a second coming, will, he will basically be the judge on the Yom al Qiyamah. Uh, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. So that's all the Holy Spirit gets in the Nicene Creed. He just gets that one little thing at the end. And by the way, we believe in the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is not on the table for discussion at the Council of Nicaea. That's going to come at the next council. right? What happened at Nicaea is they're simply dealing with the Son of God. Is the Son of God the same essence as the Father, or a different essence, or a similar essence? That's, that's what's on the table. And of course, they voted, and Christians, uh, uh, um, Christians believe that, and Catholics still believe this, uh, that at the Council of Nicaea, um, uh, there are actually 319 persons there. So 318 bishops, and then the Holy Spirit was there. And the Holy Spirit sort of guides the discussion of the bishops towards the right answer. Right? So whatever doctrine or dogma is hammered out at these ecumenical councils, and there have been 20, 22 of them, I believe, the last one was in the 1960s, called Vatican II. Um, so the, the first seven of them are believed to are, are accepted by Protestant Christians, Roman Catholics, and Eastern Orthodox. And then um, after that, from eight to 21 or 22, uh, those are only those are uh, the, the this decisions are believed by Catholics only. Uh, um, so the Eastern Orthodox stop after seven, and so do the Protestant uh, Christians. So in other words, all Trinitarian Christians believe that whatever came out of the Council of Nicaea, which was the first ecumenical council, it is infallible because it was, uh, it was a product of the providence of the Holy Spirit, who is also the third person of the Trinity. We don't get that here in the Creed yet, but we will get that later. And then <clears throat> the very last part of the creed here, uh, they actually quote the Proto-Orthodox or Trinitarian. I mean, they're not Trinitarian at this point, again. So I'm using Trinitarian as somewhat anachronistic, right? Um, uh, so um, we can say proto the Proto-Orthodox bishops they quote their theological opponents here and say, as for those who say, there was once when he was not. Right? So they're actually quoting the Arians. This was a sort of credo of the Arians um, in the early 4th century. And of course, again, Arius is present at the council. What did they used to say? Ein pate hate uk ein. There was a time when he was not. There was a time when the Son of God did not exist, right? So the Son is not pre-eternal. They're saying those who say that, and then they quote a few other things uh, that the Arians were saying, out of non-being he became, and um, the Son is changeable or alterable. These, the universal and apostolic church, uh, deems accursed, anathematizes. I mean, that's, that's the, the Greek word. Um, uh, anathematizai, which is where we get the word anathematize. In other words, they're saying that we are pronouncing kufur, we're making takfir, right, of the Arians now. That, that the Arian position that the Son of God is not pre-eternal and not fully God So that's the, that's the Nicene Creed. Now, a few years later, 
in 381, <clears throat> they held another council. It's called the Council of Constantinople. Right? So they're both in Turkey. Constantinople means the, the polis of Constantine, the city of Constantine, which is now Istanbul in Turkey. So now the, the Roman Emperor is Theodosius I, and he's definitely a Christian. There's no doubt about it. 115 bishops are present. So what's the issue now? So the issue at, or the, the problem for the Proto-Orthodox at Nicaea was these Arians who are saying that the Son of God is inferior to the Father. So they put it to vote, and majority rules, and the Son of God officially becomes God the Son after the Council of Nicaea. In 381 now, the, the issue is, what about the Holy Spirit? So now you have Christians who are saying, okay, fine. The Son and Father are homoousion. They're the same essence. But the Holy Spirit is inferior to both of them. So you, have, you don't have a trinity. You have, I don't even know what the word is. Uh, you have a, a bi-unity, because trinity comes from triune and then unity. Uh, so they're saying now there's the Father and the Son, that's the true God, and then beneath them you have the Holy Spirit, who's not quite God, right? Um, and, uh, and then you have the rest of creation beneath the Holy Spirit, right? So these enemies were dubbed pneumotamachians by the Proto-Orthodox. These are, that literally means the spirit fighters, those who are fighting against the Holy Spirit and will not recognize the full divinity of the Holy Spirit. So Theodosius I, he called for this council, <clears throat> and after, again, many deliberations, they came to the conclusion that indeed the Holy Spirit is also God. Hamausian, pneumatology. Holy Spirit shares an essential essence of the Father and the Son, although he's a different person. We have three persons, one essence. Three persons, one essence. There was a Christian theologian in the Middle Ages, uh, Hilary of Poitiers, who came up with this diagram, and it's a very famous diagram. Basically, it's a triangle, right? And so this is supposed to sort of be um, a diagram, if you will, of the Trinity. So you have a triangle. At each point, you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? And so imagine that um, on, on each side of the triangle, you have the words is not, is not, so equilateral, equilateral triangle, and at each point, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then written along the lines of all three sides, is not. So in other words, the Son is not the Father. You're a different person. The Father is not the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. Right? So this is their belief. Three separate and distinct persons. Now imagine three lines, three arrows, uh, um, coming or pointing towards the middle of the triangle from each corner. And at the center God. And written on the lines of these arrows is is. So in other words, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, the Father is God. Right? Um, probably would have been better if I brought uh, visual aids of some sort. But you can Google this, Hilary of Poitiers, the triangle diagram of the Trinity. Right? Persons, separate and distinct, who are all three God because they share an, a, a, they share an essence. The analogy that we can maybe use here, um, and there's no, there's no um, adequate analogy, uh, but Christians have, uh, you know, they've tried to posit approximations, like for example, a water, right? Um, you have water that can exist in three different states. Uh, you have liquid, vapor, and ice. And all three are H2O, essentially. One essence, three forms. The problem with that is um, 
that you can't get all three forms at the same time and place. That's what I'm told at least. So it's inadequate. Uh, another example is, or analogy is like an egg. This very famous analogy. They say God is like an egg. Um, so there's three parts. There's a shell, there's a yolk, and there's a white, yet it's one egg. The problem with this analogy is that if I just took the shell of the egg and I put it off to the corner, can I still call that egg? I can't. Now it's just shell. But if I took the Son of God and isolated him, he's totally 100% in and of himself God. So that analogy doesn't quite work either. So three persons that share an essence. It's like, um, it's like three species of the same genera. So imagine you had, um, imagine you had three species of shark. Right? So what makes a shark? How do we know what a shark is? We have to abstract the essence from attributes. A shark, in other words, a shark has certain attributes. And if it doesn't have those attributes, it doesn't qualify as being a shark. A shark has a dorsal fin. A shark has, uh, is, is, is made of cartilage. A shark has teeth. It has these sort of dots on its nose where it can sort of detect motion in the water. Um, it has, um, uh, it has a, a vertical tail, right? If a shark didn't have one of these things, it's not a shark, right? So, it, so that's how we establish the essence of shark or sharkiness, right? So imagine you have a hammerhead shark, you have a great white shark, and you have a, a bull shark, right? So you have, you have, you have three, as it were, persons of shark that all share in the essence of sharkiness. Three persons of God. So the bull shark by itself is totally shark, even though it lacks an attribute of the great white. Right? Or it lacks an attribute of the hammer head. The bull shark's head is not like a hammer, but it is 100% shark. This analogy also doesn't work because each one of these sharks has its own consciousness, right? A great white shark is over here eating something. This bull shark over here is, I don't know, just swimming around. But with the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit are inseparable in action and thought. It's called perichoresis in Greek. Whatever the Son is doing, it necessitates the participation at some level of the Father and the Holy Spirit. So the great white shark is eating something. The bull shark has no idea what that shark is doing. So maybe a better analogy is, imagine three people that all share a mind. Right? You have three different people. Let's say, uh, I don't know, you have Peter, Paul, and Mary. Right? And uh, but they all share a mind. It's one consciousness. So if Peter has a thought, Mary and Paul have that thought. If Peter you know, is hungry, the other two as well. If Peter stubs his toe, the other two feel it as well. One mind, one consciousness. Right. So the Son of God, according to Christians, according to Trinitarians, does not have the attribute of uncausation. Only the Father has that. But Christians will argue that still does not deny him his godness, the essence of godness. Just as, again using this crude analogy, just as the, uh, the, the fact that the, um, the great white shark doesn't have a hammer head does not deny the great white shark of its full sharkiness, as it were. Right? Okay. I mean, a big question is, you know, how did we get here? How do you, how did they get from, you know, a, a, a basic and simple message of Tawheed being preached in northern Palestine by a Jewish prophet to, 
you know, three hypostasis, one usia, perichoresis, homo usian, this type of thing. I would say it's from Hellenistic influence, right? We have to be careful about that um, because, as we said in the past, the Greeks were very gifted. I mean, the Arabs say, al hikmah nazalat al thalatha, that wisdom descended upon three people. Uh, the Greeks, the Chinese, and the Arabs. Of course, the Arabs also had wahi. But hikmah is not wahi, but it's, but it's very close. It's a great type of wisdom uh, they were given. So there's a lot of truth in what they're saying. I mean, Aristotle was incredible intellect. Plato, an, an incredible intellect, right? So we can take from Greek uh, thought and you know, logic, ethics even, as long as it doesn't contradict our, uh, our essentials. But Greek metaphysics, we have to be careful about. Um, and this is what Ghazali says. Ghazali was not anti-scholastic. Uh, he didn't condemn all things Greek or Hellenistic. He was, he, he was a great proponent of logic. Qistas al-Mustaqim, right? In his text on logic, says the Qistas al-Mustaqim is the, is the intellect, is reason. When Allah says in the Quran, judge by a just balance, Ghazali says that's using your reason. Using logic, he'll argue that the prophets in the Quran, they appeal to logic, logic arguments. Ibrahim alayhi salam is appealing to logic when he's, when he's telling uh, Nimrud that, you know, bring, bring the sun uh, from, the east, uh, from the west and put it in the east. He's teaching him a lesson that you're not God, you have, li you have a very limited volition. You don't have, you're not omnipotent, right? So when it comes to metaphysics, we have to be careful. So that's, that's what I would say, is that <clears throat> a, um, a significant influence of Hellenistic metaphysics just saturated the early proto-Orthodox Christians, many of whom were basically pagan philosophers, pagan philosophers <clears throat> before they became Christian, like Justin Martyr, uh, as an example. So they took these concepts and they apply it to the, basically, the Judaism, the Tawheed, uh, that uh, Islam that was by the Prophet Isa salam. And of course, if you don't have a basis in Sharia, you don't have a basis in law, you don't have a basis um, in uh, theology, correct theology, uh, then you're going to make these theological and metaphysical mistakes. Okay. So, we just have a few minutes. The Council of uh, Constantinople revised the Council of Nicaea, and now we have something called the Niceno Constantinopolitan Constantinopolitan Creed, the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed of 381, which is the first truly Trinitarian creed, because all three constituents are now dealt with: Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So now, 381 of the Common Era, you have Trinitarianism. Officially. So this is sort of a Nicene Creed 2.0. It's very much similar. There are some additions. We believe in one God, the Father, the Creator, the Maker of heaven and earth, and all things seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the unique Son of God. Now they add, the one begotten from the Father before all the ages. Right? So they're, they're not just stressing the pretemporality of the Son, which seems to have been the Arian position. Arius says, okay, fine, the sun, the sun predates time. He's the first creation, right? That still doesn't make him God, just the first creation. But what they're saying here in this creed is, no, uh, it's not, he's not pre-temporal, he's pre-eternal. The sun shares an essential pre-eternality with the Father. So he's not a possible being. So, you know, if the sun is the first of creation, then he's still just a possible being. But if he has an essential pre-eternality, then he's a necessary being. There's two types of being, right? There's their mumkinat, possible beings, and then there's wajibul wujud. There's the necessary being, the necessary existent. So that's what they're saying here. He's absolutely necessary. Light from light, true God from true God. That's now they're saying they're going back to the Nicene Creed, begotten, not made, co-substantial, so on and so forth. And then they say he became flesh. 
And then they add, by the Holy Spirit and Mary the Virgin. So they mention here the sort of parents, as it were, of, of Jesus. Um, Mary is mentioned explicitly now in the Creed. So the status of Mary keeps climbing. By the next ecumenical council, 431, the Council of Ephesus, Mary will be given the title of Theodos, which is sometimes translated as Mother of God, but that's not a good translation. It really means the bearer or carrier of God, right? And then uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries, at the strictly Roman Catholic councils, uh, Mary, um, it, it, the, the Catholics believed that Mary was assumed into heaven. She never died. She, she was carried into heaven. And they also uh, um, espoused the, the belief in what's known as the Immaculate uh, Conception that Mary was conceived without sin. She never had original sin. Those are much later developments. And then they continue, and they say something now that's not in the Nicene Creed. He was crucified. You notice the Nicene Creed did not say crucified. The Nicene Creed said, suffered and rose on the third day. So they want to make it, that doesn't mean that the bishop said, Nicaea did not believe Jesus was crucified. Of course they believed Jesus was crucified. But they just want to be more explicit here. He was crucified for our sake under Pontius Pilate. Now they mention explicitly the Roman governor of Judea, who was Pontius Pilate. So they want to situate, it seems, Jesus in history, that he was uh, really crucified. It is historical. It's not a myth. It wasn't a rumor. Right? He was crucified by Pontius Pilate. Right? It's, not just, it's not just saying he suffered. What do you mean he suffered? That's so vague. And Okay, fine, he was crucified, but you know, who, can anyone corroborate that? Here there's, yes, he was crucified uh, under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried. So they do mention suffering too, and was buried. That's something new uh, we get here uh, in this creed. So, it seems like they want to say that it was an actual body, right? Because you have different types of literal docetism. There's another term for you, docetism. A very common Christology, Christological belief in the first few centuries of Christianity. You have docetic Gnosticism that espoused that uh, Jesus never had a physical body. Huh? So you can't, you can't bury a phantasm. That, that's what he was. He was just... He was just a sort of ghost. You have docetic, docetic substitutionism. This belief that uh, Jesus' body uh, somehow escaped the crucifixion. Someone else was crucified, right? Uh, it's called the substitution theory. Someone else, Basilides, believed that Simon of Cyrene was supernaturally transferred, transformed, uh, transfigured <laughs> is the term he uses, transfiguratum, uh, uh, that, G that Jesus was transfigured to look like Simon and vice versa. That's called docetic substitutionism. You also have docetic separationism, also a belief of some of the Gnostics, that, okay, Jesus had a flesh body, and, okay, you know, they're crucifying him, but at some point, his soul left his body, before his body died, so his body didn't actually, uh, uh, so, so he didn't actually feel the pain, as it were, of the crucifixion. They simply crucified an empty shell of a body. Right? So they're saying here, he was buried. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He was suffered and he was buried. The body was underground, or he was in the tomb in this case and rose on the third day, and then they add, according to the scriptures. They didn't say that in the Nicene Creed. So this is very important for them. Fulfillment of scripture, that this was foretold to happen. All right? The Jews at the time, they had this belief, and I also believe that what the Jews were expecting about the Messiah, by the way, was erroneous, but their belief was, this Messiah will be a military leader. That he will come and he will... You know, he will take up the sword and he will completely annihilate 
these heathens, these Romans, and purify the land that God gave us um, as an inheritance. Right? So, so um, obviously Jesus didn't do that. Um, so the Jews were going to the early Christians and saying, what kind of Messiah is this? You know, he gets killed? You know, what are you talking about? How can this be the Messiah? So the Christian retort can only be, well, you're misreading your scripture. And I think the Jews were misreading the scripture. But then now we have compounded misreadings where the Christians are saying, oh, look over here in Isaiah 53, there's this prophecy of someone who's going to be uh, crushed for our iniquities, the suffering servant. And this is about the Jewish Messiah. Right? Of course, nowhere in that text does it even mention the word Messiah at all. But Christians would go back into these texts and they would sort of rework them and interpret them to fit in with what they believed happened uh, to Jesus. Isaiah 53, you know, this person, whoever this person is who is being tortured, is, is saying, he says, I was, I was led as a lamb to the slaughter. They cut me off from the land of the living. That's from Isaiah 53. And the Christians say, yes, that's exactly what happened to Jesus. But if you read the, if you read the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah actually says those words and applies it to himself. I was as a dumb lamb led to the slaughter. I opened not my mouth. I was cut off from the land of the living. So it seems whoever wrote Isaiah 53 was sitting in Babylon after the exile and was remembering the words of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is the suffering servant. I mean, it just works out completely by looking at the text. But this is how to justify what happened to Jesus, right? That it was, they say, according to the scriptures. And ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory. So they add that part too. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Not that like he's seated next to the Father, like his vizier or something. No, he's seated on the same level. They share a throne. That's what they mean by this. To judge the living and the dead. So Jesus, according to them, will be the on the Yom al Qiyamah. In the Quran, it says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Isa ibn Maryam, Did you ever say to the people that you are your mother are divinities? Jesus is not judging anyone on the Yom al Qiyamah. He will be questioned in front of the whole of humanity according to the Quran. <coughs> of course, his response, Subhanak. Glory be to you. Never did I say what I had no right to say. I said, Inna Allah Rabbi wa Rabbukum fa'abudu hadha. Uh, so, let's see how we're doing. Yeah, it's, it's 9 o'clock now. There's, there's a few more things mentioned in the creed, but, but basically they just repeat the Nicene Creed. So, we've, we've uh, come to the end of our section on Christianity. Um, as you can see that it's quite involved and requires. I hope these sessions just sort of inspire you to do uh, some more research, inshallah. So next week we're going to get into Hinduism, go way back in time and look at the basic tenets and beliefs of Hinduism, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah.